Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, we're continuing our study through the book by Andrew Murray titled Absolute Surrender. Today we find ourselves in chapter 8, which is titled, Kept by the Power of God. Our text comes from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, which read, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. The words which I would like to speak to you about today are found in 1 Peter and verse 5, when it says, kept by the power of God through faith. There we have two wonderful, blessed truths about the keeping by which a believer is kept unto salvation. One truth is kept by the power of God. The other truth is kept through faith. We should look at the two sides, at God's side and his almighty power offered to us to be our keeper every moment of the day, and at the human side, We have nothing to do but in faith, to let God do his keeping work in us. We are begotten again to an inheritance kept in heaven for us, and we are kept here on earth by the power of God. We see there is a double keeping, the inheritance kept for me in heaven, and I on earth kept for the inheritance there. Now as to the first part of this keeping, There is no doubt and no question. God keeps the inheritance in heaven very wonderfully and perfectly, and it is waiting there safely. At the same time, God keeps me for the inheritance. That is what I want to understand. You know it is very foolish of a father to take great trouble to have an inheritance for his children and to keep it for them if he does not keep them for it. What would you think of a man spending his whole time and making every sacrifice to amass money, and as he gets his tens of thousands, you ask him why it is that he sacrifices him so? If his answer is, I want to leave my children a large inheritance, and I am keeping it for them, And if you were then to hear that that man takes no trouble to educate his children, that he allows them to run upon the street wild and to go on in paths of sin and ignorance and folly, what would you think of him? Would not you say, poor man, he is keeping an inheritance for his children, but he is not keeping or preparing his children for the inheritance? And friends, there are so many Christians who think, my God is keeping the inheritance for me, but they cannot believe my God is keeping me for that inheritance. The same power, the same love, the same God doing the double work. Now, I want to speak about a work God does upon us, keeping us for the inheritance. I have already said that we have two very simple truths. The one on the divine side, which says we are kept by the power of God. The other on the human side, which says we are kept through faith. First, look at the divine side. Christians are kept by the power of God. Now think, first of all, this keeping is all inclusive. What is kept? you are kept. How much of you? The whole being. Does God keep one part of you and not another? No. Some people have an idea that this is a sort of vague general keeping and that God will keep them in such a way that when they die, 
they will get to heaven. But they do not apply that word kept to everything in their being and nature. And yet that is exactly what God wants. Here I have a watch before me. Suppose that this watch had been borrowed from a friend. And he said to me, when you go to Europe, I will let you take it with you. But mind you, keep it safely and bring it back to me. And suppose for a moment I damaged the watch, the hands broken off, the face defaced, and some of the wheels and springs spoiled. What if I took it back in that condition and handed it to my friend? Would not he say, but I lent it to you on the condition that you would keep it? Have I not kept it? Here is the watch. But I did not want you to keep it in that general way, says the friend, so that you should bring me back only the shell of the watch or the remains. I expected you to keep every part of it. Well, this is what God does. He does not want to keep us in this general way so that at the last, somehow or other, we shall be saved as by fire and just barely get into heaven. But the keeping power and love of God applies to every particular of our being. There are some people who think God will keep them in spiritual things, but not in temporal things. This latter, they say, lies outside of his line. Now, God sends you to work in the world, but he did not say, I must now leave you to go and earn your own money and to get your livelihood for yourself. He knows you are not able to keep yourself. Instead, he says, my child, there is no work you are to do and no business in which you are engaged and not a cent with which you are to spend, but I, your father, will take that up into my keeping. God not only cares for the spiritual, but for the temporal also. The greater part of the life of many people must be spent, sometimes eight or nine or ten hours a day, amid the temptations and distractions of business. But God will care for you there. The keeping of God includes the whole of your life. Now, there are other people who think, ah, in time of trial, God keeps me. But in times of prosperity, I do not need his keeping. Then I forget him and let him go. Others may think the very opposite when they say, in time of prosperity, when things are smooth and quiet, I am able to cling to God. But when heavy trials come, somehow or other, my will rebels, and God does not keep me then. Now I bring you the message that in prosperity, as in adversity, in the sunshine, as in the dark, your God is ready to keep you all the time. Then again, there are others who may think this way. God will keep me from doing very great wickedness, but there are small sins, sins that I cannot expect God to keep me from. This may be the sin of temper. I cannot expect God to conquer that. When you hear of some man who has been tempted and gone astray or fallen into drunkenness or murder, you thank God then for his keeping power. You say to yourself, I might have done the same as that man if God had not kept me. And you believe he kept you from drunkenness and murder. And so you say to yourself, I expect God keep me from drunkenness and murder. But why should I believe that God can keep me from outbreaks of temper? Now you thought that this was of less importance, but you did not remember that the great commandment of the New Testament is love one another as I have loved you. And when your temper and hasty judgment and sharp words come out, you sin against the highest law the law of God's love. And yet you say to yourself, God will not, God cannot, God does not keep me from that. You might say, I know that he can, but there is something in me that cannot attain to it. And it is this that God does not take away. Well, I want to ask you, friend, can believers live a holier life than is generally lived? 
Can believers experience the keeping power of God all throughout their day in keeping them from sin, every sin? Can believers be kept in fellowship with God? Well, it is here I bring you the message from the Word of God when it says, kept by the power of God. There is no qualifying clause to these words. The meaning is that if you will entrust yourself entirely and absolutely to the omnipotence of God, he will delight to keep you. Some people think that they never can get so far as that every word of their mouth should be to the glory of God. But it is what God wants of them. It is what God expects of them. God is willing to set a watch at the door of their mouth. And if God will do that, can he not keep their tongue and their lips? Well, yes, he can. And that is what God is going to do for them that trust him. God's keeping is all-inclusive. Let everyone who longs to live a holy life think out all their needs and all their weaknesses and all their shortcomings and all their sins and then say deliberately, is there any sin that my God cannot keep me from? And the heart will have to answer, no, God can keep me from every sin, hallelujah. Well now, let us understand, if we want to understand this keeping, that it is not only an all-inclusive keeping, but it is an almighty keeping. I want to get that truth burned into my soul. I want to worship God until my whole heart is filled with the thought of his omnipotence. God is almighty, and the almighty God offers himself to work in my heart, to do the work of keeping me, and I want to get linked with omnipotence, or rather, linked to the omnipotent one, to the living God, and to have my place in the hollow of his hand. When you read the Psalms, and you think of the wonderful thoughts in many of the expressions that David uses. For instance, when he speaks about God being our God, our fortress, our refuge, our strong tower, our strength, and our salvation. David had very wonderful views of how the everlasting God is himself the hiding place of the believing soul and of how he takes the believer and keeps him in the very hollow of his hand, in the secret of his pavilion, under the shadow of his wings. And there is where David lived. And oh, we who are the children of Pentecost, we who have known Christ and his blood and his Holy Spirit sent down from heaven, why is it we know so little of what it is to walk in trembling step by step with the Almighty God as our keeper? Have you ever thought that in every action of grace in your heart, you have the whole omnipotence of God engaged to bless you? When I come to a man and he bestows upon me a gift of money, I get it and go away with it. He has given me something of his. The rest he keeps for himself. But that is not the way with the power of God. God can part with nothing of his own power. And therefore, I can experience the power and goodness of God only so far as I am in contact and fellowship with him. And when I come into contact and fellowship with him, I come into contact and fellowship with the whole omnipotence of God and have the omnipotence of God to help me throughout every moment of my day. A son has perhaps a very rich father, and as the former is about to commence business, the father says, you can have as much money as you want for your undertaking. All the father has is at the disposal of the son, and that is the way with God, your almighty God. You can hardly take it in. You feel yourself such a little worm. Yes, his omnipotence is needed to keep every little worm that lives in the dust and also at the same time to keep the universe 
and therefore his omnipotence is much more needed in keeping your soul and mine from the power of sin. Oh, friend, if you want to grow in grace, do learn to begin here. In all your judgings and meditations and thoughts and deeds and questionings and studies and prayers, learn to be kept by your almighty God. What is almighty God not going to do for the child that trusts him? The Bible says above all that we can ask or think. It is omnipotence you must learn to know and trust. And then you will live as a Christian ought to live. How little we have learned to study God and to understand that a godly life is a life full of God, a life that loves God and waits on God and trusts God and allows God to bless his life. We cannot do the will of God except by the power of God. God gives us the first experience of his power to prepare us to long for more and to come and claim all that he can do. God help us to trust him every day. Well, here's another thought. This keeping is not only all-inclusive and omnipotent, but it is also continuous and unbroken. People sometimes say, for a week or a month, God has kept me very wonderfully. I have lived in the light of his countenance. And I cannot say what joy I have not had in fellowship with him. He has blessed me in my work for others. He has given me souls. And at times I felt as if I were carried heavenward on eagle's wings. But, alas, it did not continue. It was too good. It could not last. And some say it was necessary that I should fall to keep me humble. And others say, I know it was my own fault, but somehow you cannot always live up in the heights. Oh, beloved, why is it? Can there be any reason why the keeping of God should not be continuous and unbroken? Just think, all life is in unbroken continuity. If my life were stopped for half an hour, I would be dead and my life gone. Life is a continuous thing, and the life of God is the life of his church, and the life of God is his almighty power working in us, his church, and God comes to us as the almighty one, and without any condition, he offers to be our keeper, and his keeping means that day by day, moment by moment, God is going to keep us. Now, if I were to ask you the question, do you think God is able to keep you one day from actual transgression? You would say, I not only know he is able to do it, but I think he has done it. There have been days in which he has kept my heart in his holy presence. When though I have always had a sinful nature within me, he has kept me from conscious actual transgression. Well, if he can do that for an hour or a day, why not two days? Oh, friend, let us make God's omnipotence as revealed in his word, the measure of our expectations. Has God not said in his word, I, the Lord, do keep it and will water it every moment? Isaiah 27, 3. What can that mean? Does every moment really mean every moment? Did God promise of that vineyard or red wine that every moment he would water it so that the heat of the sun and the scorching wind might never dry it up? Yes. In South Africa, they sometimes make a graft and above it, they tie a bottle of water so that now and then there shall be a drop to saturate what they have put about it. And so the moisture is kept there unceasingly until the graft has had time to stroke or attach and resist the heat of the sun. Will our God in his tender-hearted love toward us not keep us every moment when he has promised to do so? Oh, if we once got hold of this thought, 
Our whole Christian life is to be God's doing. It is God that works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. When once we get faith to expect that from God, God will do all for us. The keeping is to be continuous. Every morning, God will meet you as you wake. It is not a question, if I forgot to wake in the morning with the thought of him, what will come of it? If you trust your waking to God, God will meet you in the morning as you wake with his divine sunshine and love. And he will give you the consciousness that through the day, God is by your side to take charge of you continuously and with his almighty power. And God will meet you the next day and the next day and every day the rest of your life. And never mind if in the practice of fellowship there comes failure sometimes. If you maintain your position and say, Lord, I am going to expect thee to do thy utmost and I am going to trust thee day by day to keep me absolutely. Your faith will grow stronger and stronger, and you will know the keeping power of God in unbrokenness. Well, now let us look at the other side, the human side, which says, kept by the power of God through faith. How must we look at this faith? Faith implies helplessness. Let me say that again. Faith implies helplessness. Now, let me say, first of all, that this faith means utter impotence and helplessness before God. At the bottom of all faith, there is a feeling of helplessness. If I have a bit of business to transact, perhaps to buy a house, the conveyancer must do the work of getting the transfer of the property in my name and making all the arrangements. I cannot do that work, and in trusting that agent, I confess I cannot do it. And so faith always means helplessness. In many cases, it means I can do it with a great deal of trouble, but another can do it better. But in most cases, it is utter helplessness, Another must do it for me. And that is the secret of the spiritual life. A man must learn to say, I give up everything. I have tried and longed. I have thought and prayed, but failure has come. God has blessed me and helped me. But still, in the long run, there has been so much of sin and sadness. What a change comes when a man is thus broken down into utter helplessness and self-despair and says, I can do nothing. Remember Paul? He was living a blessed life and he had been taken up into the third heaven and then the thorn in the flesh came, a messenger of Satan sent to buffet him. And then what happened? Paul could not understand it and he prayed to the Lord three times to take it away. But the Lord said, in effect, no, it is possible that you might exalt yourself, Paul, and therefore I have sent this trial to keep you weak and humble. And it was there that Paul learned a lesson he never forgot, and that was to rejoice in his infirmities. He said that the weaker he was, the better it was for him. For when he was weak, he was strong in his Lord Christ. Do you want to enter into what people call the higher life? Then go a step lower down. Let me say that again. Do you want to enter into the higher life? Then you must step down lower. I remember Dr. Boardman telling how that once he was invited by a gentleman to go see some works where they had made fine shots. And I believe the workman did so by pouring down molten lead from a great height. This gentleman wanted to take Dr. Broadman up to the top of the tower to see how the work was done. The doctor came to the tower. He entered by the door. He began going upstairs. But when he had gone a few steps, the gentleman called out, That is the wrong way. You must come down this way. 
that stair is locked up. The gentleman took him downstairs a good many steps, and there an elevator was ready to take him to the top. And he said, I have learned a lesson that going down is often the best way to get up, to get to the top. Oh, yes, friends, God will have to bring us very low down. There will have to come upon us a sense of emptiness and despair and nothingness. It is when we sink down in utter helplessness that the everlasting God will reveal himself in great power and that our hearts will learn to trust God alone. What is it that keeps us from trusting him perfectly? For many say, I believe what you say, but there is one difficulty. If my trust were perfect and always abiding, all would come right, for I know God will honor trust. But how am I to get that trust? And my answer is by death of self. The great hindrance to trust is self-effort. So long as you have got your own wisdom and thoughts and strength, you cannot fully trust God. But when God breaks you down, when everything begins to grow dim before your eyes, and you see that you understand nothing, then God is coming nigh. And if you will bow down in that nothingness and wait upon God, he will become your all. As long as we are something, God cannot be all and his omnipotence cannot do its full work. That is the beginning of faith, utter despair of self, a ceasing from man and everything on earth and finding our hope in God alone. And then next, we must understand that faith is rest. In the beginning of the faith life, faith is struggling. But as long as faith is struggling, faith has not attained its strength. But when faith in its struggling gets to the end of itself and just throws itself upon God and rests on him, then comes joy and victory. Perhaps I can make it plainer if I tell the story of how the Keswick Convention began. Canon Battersby was an evangelical clergyman of the Church of England for more than 20 years. He was a man of deep and tender godliness but he had not the consciousness of rest and victory over sin. And often he was deeply sad at the thought of stumbling and failure and sin. When he heard about the possibility of victory, he felt it was desirable, but it was as if he could not attain it. On one occasion, he heard an address on rest and faith from the story of the nobleman who came from Capernaum to Cana to ask Christ to heal his child. In the address, it was shown that the nobleman believed that Christ could help him in a general way. But he came to Jesus a good deal by way of an experiment. He hoped that Christ would help him, but he had not any assurance of that help. But what happened? When Christ said to him, Go thy way, for thy child liveth. That man believed the word that Jesus spoke. He rested in that word. He had no proof that his child was well again, and he had to walk back seven hours' journey to Capernaum to find out. He walked back, and on that way he met his servant, and he got the first news that the child was well, that at nine o'clock of the previous day, at the very time that Jesus spoke to him, the fever left the child. That father rested upon the word of Jesus and his work, and he went down to Capernaum and found his child well. He praised God, and he became with his whole house believers and disciples of Jesus. Oh, friends, that is faith. When God comes to me with the promise of his keeping, and I have nothing on earth to trust in, yet I say to God, Thy word is enough, kept by the power of God. That is faith, friends. That is rest. When Canon Battersby heard that address, he went home that night, and in the darkness of the night, he found rest. 
he rested on the words of Jesus. And the next morning in the streets of Oxford, he said to a friend, I have found it. Then he went and told others and asked that the Keswick Convention might be begun. And those at the convention with himself should testify simply what God had done. It is a great thing when a man comes to rest on God's almighty power for every moment of his life. In prospect of temptations to temper and haste and anger and unlovingness and pride and sin. It is a great thing in prospect of these to enter into a covenant with the omnipotent Jehovah, not on account of anything that any man says or of anything that my heart may feel, but on the strength of the word of God, kept by the power of God through faith. Oh, let us say to God that we are going to prove him to the very uttermost. Let us say, we ask thee for nothing more than thou canst give, but we want nothing less. Let us say, my God, let my life be a proof of what the omnipotent God can do. Let these be the two dispositions of our souls every day, deep helplessness and simple childlike rest. Now that brings me to just one more thought in regard to faith. Faith implies fellowship with God. Many people want to take the word and believe it. They find they cannot believe it, however. But friends, we must understand we cannot separate God from his word. No goodness or power can be received separate from God. And if you want to get into this life of godliness, holiness, you must take time for fellowship with God. People sometimes tell me, my life is one of such scurry and bustle that I have no time for fellowship with God. A dear missionary even said to me, people do not know how we missionaries are tempted. I get up at five o'clock in the morning and there are the natives waiting for their orders for work. Then I have to go to the school and spend hours there. And then there is more work. And 16 hours I rush along and I hardly get time to be alone with God. But can't you see? That is their want. That is what they need most. That is where they are lacking. I pray you, friend, remember two things. I have not told you to trust the omnipotence of God as a thing. And I have not told you to trust the word of God as a written book. But I have told you to go to the God of omnipotence and the God of the word. Deal with God as that nobleman dealt with the living Christ. Why was he able to believe the word that Christ spoke to him? Because in the very eyes and tones and voice of Jesus, the Son of God, he saw and heard something which made him feel that he could trust him. And that is what Christ can do for you and me. Do not try to stir and arouse faith from within. How often I have tried to do that and made a fool of myself. You cannot stir up faith from the depths of your heart. Leave your heart and look into the face of Jesus and listen to what he tells you about how he will keep you. Look up into the face of your loving father and take time every day with him and begin a new life with the deep emptiness and poverty of a man who has got nothing and who wants to get everything from Jesus with the deep restfulness of a man who rests on the loving God, the omnipotent Jehovah. And try God, and prove him if he will not open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings that you will not have room to be able to receive. I close by asking if you are willing to experience to the very full the heavenly keeping for the heavenly inheritance. Robert Murray McChain says, O oh God, make me as holy as a pardoned sinner can be made. If that prayer is in your heart, come now, come now and let us enter into a covenant with the everlasting and omnipotent Jehovah. Let us do it as if we had never done before and let us do it 
with great helplessness, but in great restfulness, let us place ourselves in his hands. And then as we enter into our covenant, let us have this one prayer that we may believe fully that the everlasting God is going to be our companion, holding our hand every moment of the day, that he will be our keeper, watching over us without a moment's interval, that he will be our father, delighting to reveal himself in our souls always. He has the power to let the sunshine of his love be with us, friends, each and every moment of each and every day. Do not be afraid because you have got your business that you cannot have God with you always. Learn the lesson that the natural sun shines upon you all day and you enjoy its light. Wherever you are, you've got the sun. So it is God takes care that his sun will always shine upon you. And God will take care that his own divine light shines within you and that you will abide in that light if you will only trust him for it. Let us trust God to do that with a great and entire trust. Here is the omnipotence of God. And here is faith reaching out to the measure of that omnipotence. Shall we not say all that that omnipotence can do I am going to trust my God for it. Are not the two sides of this heavenly life wonderful? God's omnipotence covers me, and my will, in its littleness, rests in that omnipotence and rejoices in it. Moment by moment, I'm kept in his love. Moment by moment, I've life from above. Looking to Jesus, the glory doth shine. Moment by moment, O oh Lord, I am thine. Well, friends, that brings us to the end of chapter 8 today, and I have nothing to add. I just can only pray and trust that God has worked in your soul through this reading as he has in mine. For I know that I have been deeply moved by the hand of God, and I have been challenged in new ways that I can be assured, and you can be assured, friends, if we will only obey what it is we have learned, we will grow into the beautiful creatures of God that he has so designed us to be. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.